Do join us as rock legend and founding member of the Tommy Bolin Band, Mark Stein, who began his career with the Vanilla Fudge, joins us for an in-depth conversation about his career and his time in the Tommy Bolin Band. Stay tuned for part one. Well, I am thrilled and uh, just blown away here today that uh, Mark Stein has joined us for an in-depth look not only at uh, his time with Tommy Bolin and his feelings about Tommy Bolin, but also his amazing career. I think I, I, I think you qualify as a rock legend, and so we're going to celebrate that truth. Not that that means that much here in 2022, but uh, I, I'm I'm blown away that you're here with me, and we can go. Well, I'm happy in. to be able to be here. First off, and I appreciate you inviting me on. And what we're going to do here is I want to do three chapters within this. One would be your background, your childhood, how you got hooked into music, how you got yourself going, and then how Vanilla Fudge came to pass. Then your time with uh, Tommy. And then what's going on now, both in terms of Fudge shows and your own music and your album, your first album that you finally were able to get out. And so that's what we're going to do here. But I thought we would get started by me sharing... Uh, you keep me hanging on here. Yeah. Talk about talk about urgent. I mean, wow. Um, yeah, that was pretty intense, man. <clears throat> doing the Sullivan show was that was it. That was that was the big time. You know, it was eight o'clock at night. Or if it was nine o'clock, I'm not sure. I don't remember what hour it was, but you were in everybody's living room in, in the United States and probably around most of the world. So that was the moment. <laughs> you know, that was a moment, and uh, it became a household word. You know, for at least another few weeks <laughs> because the exposure was absolutely incredible. And uh, I mean, just the first time being on the show with Duke Ellington and Flip Wilson and. Just all of these uh, huge stars and all the different fields from the day was uh, pretty special. And, you know, all our fans and friends and families were just so proud. You know, it was uh, really it was a great time in our lives, for sure. Did you meet Duke? Briefly. But Flip Wilson, you know, after the show was over, I know we went over really, really well. And I, there was a payphone. Anybody remembers payphones? There was a payphone. <laughs> By the side of the stage, and I dialed my mom in Bayonne, New Jersey. You know, the show was live in New York City. I mean, did you see it, Mom? You know, and it was just all hysterical, happy. Flip Wilson comes up to me, pats me on the shoulder, and says, "What a nice kid!" Calling his mom and dad right after he did the Sullivan show. I'll never forget that. You know, it was like an emotional moment. So, but that was uh, pretty far out. Yeah. So what? So what was, at that point in time, you guys were obviously ready for prime time, musically and as far as the showmanship goes. What was the camaraderie like at that point within the band? You guys, what do you remember about just the brotherhood of the Vanilla Fudge? That well, night? I mean, at that time, the camaraderie was, uh, you know, pretty strong. You know, we used to fool around when we were kids, putting bands together. So one day, you know, we want to be pop stars and, you know, because we were always checking out. The Beatles, and the Stones, and the Rascals, and you know the whole uh, British invasion, loving all that music and Motown. You know, music was uh, you know, that was our mutual connection. It was, uh, it was fantastic, and uh, that's all we did, and that's all we wanted to be. It was successful, and we just really worked hard. We came up uh, with this approach to music, this uh, psychedelic symphonic rock approach because at the time you know we, we we didn't even entertain writing songs because we came up with this concept and you know took Beatles songs and Sonny and Cher all this you know the songs that we love from the day the pop songs and we completely break them down and reimagine the whole approach we keep the lyrics you know change the emotion of the lyrics but the music was you know like the king and I it was one of my favorite soundtracks. I used to listen to a lot of soundtracks. So if you listen to the beginning of Bang Bang, that's the March of the Siamese Children. I came up with that whole thing on the Hammond. You know? But if you listen to it, it slowed down. It's this really 
heavy duty thing I, that I did. And uh, I remember at rehearsal, everybody came up with these parts and it was awesome. It just came together. Even now in retrospect, when I listened to that track, I said, wow, man, we had it really going on for, uh, for a bunch of young dudes. And of course, keeping me hanging on, you know, eventually, you know, went to the top of the charts and the uh, same kind of thing. And I was just heard to come over the radio one day with Tim Bogart, God rest his soul. And he looked at each other and said, man, that would be a great tune to slow down, man, you know, and uh, put some more soul into the lyrics. It was, it was a great song, but it felt like very happy. And uh, I came up with this minor approach to it, the minor key, and I had this uh, introduction on the Hammond and this idea with all these dynamics. I, and I got together with Vinnie Martel at the club uh, Ongano's on the west side where we were playing. And during the day, uh, we'd work together on it. And he had this incredible rock, raga look in the beginning of hanging on. It's like actually now it's like the top 10 Catholics of all time, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Palmine and Tim, you know, met us about an hour later. We just started putting it together, the rhythm section parts and the, the funk, the grooves, all the different vocals. And I guess it was just meant to be because after a couple of hours, we knew we had something really special. We wanted to unleash it on the world and we did. And, uh, you know, fast forward over half a century, century later, you know, it's become one of the iconic tracks in the classic rock era. So I'm proud to have been a part of that, you know. And, uh, and, and, and obviously you guys as a band had the right approach and the instrumental piece is just huge, but somebody had the lead vocal chair there, you, and I think what a gift you've got in terms of that voice that you're able to emote. I, you know, I tell you, I've been really blessed. I've been really lucky uh, to be still singing 55 years on after that. Um, yeah, I mean, I just used to love all the R&B stuff, you know, Aretha Franklin, The Temptations, the whole, mo like I mentioned, all, all of that great music. And, uh, you know, I just, I just had this natural ability and uh, had a commercial sounding voice. Uh, a white blue eyed soul brother, <laughs> you know, I guess they call me. <laughs> Still do now. And uh, that's the deal. And then, uh, you know, over time, I mean, we used to tour with Led Zeppelin and Hendrix, but Robert Plant used to blow my mind. We used to call it Banshee singing, you know, with that high, earth shattering, bone chilling vocals. And I kind of like was inspired by his vocals later on in my career. And I started reaching for higher notes and uh during the 80s i was really into that but now in my tender years <laughs> i've gone back <laughs> to what feels comfortable for me and that's singing within my my range so I'm, I'm i'm doing okay you know yeah you mentioned not to skip ahead or skip around or whatever but I, before i get into asking you about how your home life helped inspire you you mentioned zeppelin and of course, it's a famous story about how their very first concert was here in Denver. Right. And Barry, Barry Faye was just getting going. And I was at that show. Karen was at that show. And I just interviewed wow. Rick, Rick Schmidt, who was a, a close compatriot of Dave Brown and Tommy's in Denver from 68, 69, 70. He was at that show. And it just made me wonder if in your you know, connecting and getting involved and having Tommy as a, as a bud. Did he ever mention anything about maybe being at that show as well? No, I don't recall. I don't recall. Yeah. So the point is, though, there's three people right there, me being one of them, that were at that show. Because I was, I wanted to see Vanilla Fudge. And yeah. Spirit, Spirit was just starting to happen. And that was one Spirit of my first. Cool. Yep. That was one of my mechanical first major. World, mechanical World. I love that. Yeah, it's like an orchestrated one of the first bands that had orchestras and stuff like that. I remember it was a really nice, nice song and track. Yeah. And I, I know you have a story. You're aware of that story about how Led Zeppelin wound up being their very, very, very first American show on the Vanilla Fudge Spirit yeah. Bill in in Denver. Can you share yeah, well, about that? When the Elbows. Your birds broke up in the case came to America with three unknowns, Robert Plant, John Paul Jones, and uh, Bonzo. 
John Bonham, and uh, he got he got the deal with uh, Ahmed Erdogan at Atlantic Records, and was, we were on Atco, so it was like a family tree. Atlantic Atco, so we basically we were kind of label mates, and uh, management wanted Zeppelin to when the album first came out, it started making really good noise. I mean, I heard. Days of Confused before it was ever released on the very first album at my agent's house. I said, these guys are going to open for you. We're trying to work something out. And I was like, wow. It sounds really, wow, really cool approach. It sounds great. And uh, So anyway, back to Denver. Uh, the show was already booked. We were headlining. and uh, I think it was Barry Faye said, look, you know, the only way the, the new band's going to open for you guys is you're going to have to pay it's like, you know, I put my budget together and that's that. So we ended up having to take, I think, five or six hundred bucks out of our fee and give it to Zeppelin so they could cover their expenses. You know, we're talking, you know, 54 years ago. So money went a lot f- further. It's not like a lot of money now, but back then, whatever. But uh, that was it. That's how they got on the show. And, uh, they started opening for us at a lot of shows around the Northwest and we became friends. And I saw them evolve and I knew they were going to be really famous, you know, but I never knew they were going to go all the way to Pluto. You know? <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> I said, tell my wives, the wives and girlfriends, that, you know, you've got, you, you know, your boys are going to be, I think it's bigger, bigger than the cream. It was a big arena act at the time. The fudge was pretty big in those days too, but frame was like the ultimate draw, and uh, it became, uh, you know, the rock band of the ages. So, so usually the uh, headliners ensconced in their dressing room before a concert like that. Did did you come out to actually see their set? Oh yeah, yeah. It used to come to I think the first time we played. It was, Bang on a door and come to only hang out with us. You know, John Paul Jones was just this innocent kid. I want to see you guys. I want to see Karma. And, you know, and, uh, I used to watch our show all the time. And I know we inspired a lot of performance because when I first started playing, they were, they were really spastic, you know. And uh, Robert Plant wasn't moving cool, and Jimmy Page had small lamps, and we could tell them uh, you got to get bigger equipment. And I know it sounds a little condescending, but it's true. That was the beginning days of Led Zeppelin, and uh, they started to uh, just evolve. And uh, I mean, by the second tour, that was just ridiculous. If anybody saw them, the Led Zeppelin, you know, in their second tour, you'll know the passion and uh, the intensity that I experienced on the spot and back in those days. So uh, yeah, so there you go. And so that all had roots for you back in your early childhood. What was the atmosphere in the house in terms of support for music, for the idea of, because you obviously were drawn into music, I would assume. Well, my dad, my dad, you know, in the early days when I was 11, 10, 11 years old, he always used to have me out there playing. I started out on the accordion. He wanted me to be a, you know, accordion player. Polka? Myron Warren from the Lawrence yeah. Rope Show. I mean, that was like a big thing back then. Even the late, great Ray Manzarek started that way. And a lot of other known keyboard players in the 60s probably started out with the accordion. And I, I, my chops were pretty good on that. I started learning how to play real fast on it up and down. That had something to do with, you know, the transition into an organ later on. And it really helped, to be honest. Um, but my dad... You know, did everything he could to get me out in the street, and he he got me on the show in New York City. Uh, it's crazy. I was only 11 years old, and I hooked up with all these people. I auditioned for the show, and uh, and I and I got hired at 11. And uh, the MC of the show was a cat named Neil Scott, who uh, was about 18 years old or 17, and. Uh, he wrote a song for me. He took me in the studio. Go, give me a chance. And there was a, I got this little deal on this label in New York City. You know, and I uh, got to play it on a TV show in Washington, D.C., which was part of that first little tour with this rock show that I was in. Pretty amazing. 11 years old, and I'm like in the middle of uh, all this stuff. 
I'm at the rehearsal hall. I walk in and there's Johnny and the Hurricanes and under Red River Rock. I walk in and I'm like this kid and uh, they close the door and they put me in the middle of the room and they played Red River Rock. And uh, I mean, I was just so blown away to be that young. You have a live rock and roll band like that. It was like, just, I haven't forgot that, you know? That was a big top 10 single back in 1958 or something, you know? But anyway, I was on the show in the, I think it was called the Milk Grant Dance Party. I've got a pretty good memory here. And believe it or not, Sam Cook was on the show and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Don Cushing, you know, the big Vegas guy. Famous yeah, dude. Wayne Newton. Wayne, Wayne Newton, Newton, 16, baby. he was on the show. And I got the <laughs> debut, uh, Give Me a Chance, and I was playing rhythm guitar back then. And, uh, anyway, I've, I've been in this business, you know, since <laughs> I'm an adolescent. You know, it's amazing. Then Jeez. I went back to school. I was only in the seventh grade. Crazy, right? And then uh, what, how, what, it was 1964. You lived in... Was it the city or just on the island? Were you in the New York area, obviously? 1964? Yeah. <clears throat> the the Bay the Bay Bay Bay. Bay. <clears throat> and, so, and so the Beatles came to New York to be on Ed Sullivan. Of course, everybody watching that had such a huge impact. But I oh, lived God. on Long Island. I lived on Long Island then. And I think the piece that doesn't get looked at as often is for all the people who 12, 13, 14 years old that New York City went wild and all the, you know, WABC became WA Beatles C, playing nothing but right. Beatles 24-7, that that would have had an extra, extra impact on everybody there in the New York area. And yeah, so many we bands. Listen to, we listen to WABC all the time and WMCA, the good guys, at the other station. And yeah. uh, just couldn't wait for the new Beatles set, uh, single. It seemed like every week or something, the new Beatles it was incredible. Or every month, I don't know what it was, but they came out with song after song. And they were all amazing. And yeah, very inspiring. So, so what band did you, being a Beatle. What, what band was, for you, was the next in like 64, 65? What, what, well, the first time I saw the Rascals, the young Rascals, they was, you know, knocked out by Felix Cavalieri and really inspired me to get my first time in Beatry Organ because I used to see him play live as much as I could. And uh, yeah, I'm only about 18 years old at the time. So I was like a sponge, you know? I loved his singing and his soul and his approach to the Hammond. So my dad, uh, you know, helped me to get my first organ. We got it, it's like three grand. And, and a Leslie, I parked on Tim Boca's porch in uh, Richfield, New Jersey. And I, that's where I went there every day and uh, learned how to use it. And that's when we started rehearsing. We had the organ moved into his garage and we had a band called The Pigeons and uh, got Vinnie Martell recruited from the Bronx. And uh, we had a drummer called Joey Brennan at the time. And uh, we, we just started calling clubs and uh, we started getting booked in the New Jersey area. Started playing, you know, it was fun, it was cool. Yeah, and it's obvious that the Rascals were just, they just ruled at that time yeah, that in, the New, in the New York area. That was the first concert I ever went to. I was 15, and it was when they played at the West Hempstead Arena. Uh, Sid Bernstein had gotten them on the bill between the Birds and the Dillards, two bands that right. didn't move at all, and the Rascals were in the middle. It was the original Birds. And of course, the Rascals were just the most dynamic, kinetic live show. And I can see that vibe in that Sullivan clip with you guys. You know, yeah, they especially had... if you saw them in a small club. If they didn't have a bass player, Felix played bass pedals. He had two levels. So that was amazing to me, too, that he could sing and play the way he did and, you know, play the bass with his feet on the bass pedals. And uh, yeah. He saw him at a small club, it was tighter and more powerful. But then when you started playing bigger places, it was just wasn't cutting it. So eventually they had to get a bass player. You know, they get that, you know, real bottom end of live and like the records. So <laughs> So the so the pigeons they 
obviously had some traction, but how did that evolve to the vanilla fudge? Well, we went, we went to see a band called The Vagrants in Long Island. We actually opened up for The Vagrants at a place called The Eye out in Long Island. And this band, The Vagrants, came on after we, you know, we played a top 40 set. You know, it was okay. But uh, when I saw this band, The Vagrants, it was the most shocking night of my young life. Leslie West was the guitar player in that band, by the way. Yep. And uh, first time I saw a band taking songs and ripping them apart and rebuilding them, they used to do like Exodus and If I Was a Carpenter. And everything they did, they would slow it down. And Peter Sabatino was an amazing front man with his long hair. He sweat with the drama, sweat would fly into the lights. It had strobe lights and it was just, uh, the organ player had these, Jerry Storch, his name was, you know, these incredible thunderous windups. I was just mesmerized, you know? And when I left that night, I, that changed my life, really. I mean, I loved the Rascals and their blue-eyed soul. But when I saw this band of Agents, I knew this is what I wanted to do, you know? And uh, I started coming up with these uh, templates, you know, for all the songs that uh, eventually became first album which went to top 10 you know once it came out but that's how that inspiration happened that's what uh, that's what came into play in those days so uh yeah i mean you're all a product of your influences aren't we <laughs> yep for sure and this, like you say being a sponge helps uh, yeah just so open and having the ears having whatever is upstairs in the head to be able to just really take it all in and then want to put it back out there again. And, and at the time, you know, AM radio was just three minute song, two minutes and 50 seconds. You couldn't get on radio if you had it. And Fudge came up with these, you know, long symphonic dirges and arrangements and you keep hanging on. It was like over seven minutes long. Most of us stuff was, take me for a little while, was the only one that was like a little under three minutes. That was a, that was a true single. But all those other tunes, I mean, if it wasn't for the advent of underground radio, you know, like W N E W F M in New York and all the, you know, the stations in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and what have you. I mean, they opened the door for bands like The Fudge and all the bands that followed. And they played, used to play a whole first album. Was, I mean, the whole thing from the whole side without any commercials. <laughs> and it was uh, an incredible time, a glorious time to be at the center of the pop music universe in the late 60s. So how did Carmine, how did Carmine huh? wind up? How did Carmine wind up becoming, getting in the mix? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question because uh, I knew what I wanted to do musically and so did Tim Bogart and, uh, and Vinny Martel. So, uh, but Joey was a good drummer, kind of played like straight ahead, like Charlie Watts kind of drummer. But we needed somebody that had an extra voice and somebody that had the capability of uh, playing with more power and you know dynamics and stuff. So we you knew we had to get a, another drama to fulfill our destiny, as it were. <laughs> so me and Tim went hunting around for different clubs and we walked into a place called the Choo Choo Club in Garfield, New Jersey. And uh, I think there was a band called Thursdays children and this guy Carmine was playing drums and he was like, wow, the cat was like so powerful. And he had amazing fills and he looked really cool. And uh, I looked at Tim, I said, now we, we got to talk to this guy. I'm going to go back and see if I can get him outside. <laughs> I remember it was like a cold day, cold night. And uh, I told him, you know, what we wanted to do vocally and instrumentally. And uh, he got really excited and he goes, man, that sounds great. He goes, I'm in, let's, let's try this, you know. Now my dad uh, got us a place to rehearse at the back of a bar uptown uh, on the east side of uh, Bayonne, New Jersey. And at the time we got together, we started rehearsing and we, we came up with all this music so fast. We had an instant uh, electric chemistry and uh, he got us an audition with this cat called Basile at the Action House in Long Island. And we went and played for him and he really liked the band and he took us on. And that's how, that was the beginning of that next level. We started playing. The Vagrants were always the, the big powerhouse. It was where the people we'd open for the Vagrants. You know, 
<laughs> it was uh it was always like a power struggle. They had the big name, but we started getting better and better, you know. We started traveling to Newport, Rhode Island, where we got a following going back and forth between Rhode Island and Long Island and New Jersey. And uh, we just started developing a lot of momentum. And when we came up with Keaton hanging on, Shadow Martin was called in from my manager and he was knocked out. He took us in the studio. We did it in one take. New York City. We took it to Atlantic, and <laughs> they were blown away. And uh, who was that? Amit. Dr- uh, was it Amit himself? Amit, yeah, Amit Erdogan, yeah. That's how it all you evolved. Know? Before you knew it, we were in the studio. We were just pretty much recording what was on our first album. That was our that was our club show, and uh, you know we knew what we were doing at that time, and. Uh, you know, when that album came out, it was incredible. I mean, it came out in August of 67. And by, uh, I think by the early fall, it was being played all over the radio. And our first major gig was, believe it or not, opening for the Mamas and the Papas <laughs> at the Portland Coliseum in front of sold out 20,000 people. It's kind of like the Rascals playing on the band, on the bill with the birds. Uh, yeah, but the moms and papas was, was so huge then, especially that was that hometown. And I remember, you know, getting up to play. Uh, you know, as I said, but, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time coming from New York, please welcome the new band in North Fudge. And you hear boo, you know, like 20,000 people sneering and booing. It was all, nobody knew who we were. Moms and papas fans, you know. So instead of me getting freaked out, I just planted my mic, uh, mouth on the mic and I screamed. I said, we just traveled 3,000 miles to play for you people and we're going to play whether you like it or not. You know, and then everybody went, ow! Oh! It changed the whole vibe. And it was great, you know. So we went and played and it was pretty cool. And uh, that's how we got started. And I remember going backstage and looking at Palmer Cass and Dowdy and the uh, I was just like, you know, starstruck because I loved their sound. I loved their voices and their songs. And that was the beginning of uh, a hell of a career, you know. So who who be, who was the booking agent for the Fudge at that point? Who was booking us? Yeah. I think it was a, wow, I think it was GAC. It was a, one of the big booking agencies of the time out of New York. Yeah. And, and at that point, everything just kind of exploded. All these bands all of a sudden had a following. There was a whole new generation of uh, bands that were then being featured uh, that you guys were right on that front edge of who were doing a oh, heavier... Thing is, we were like fans of everybody. I mean, here we are playing with the Birds, Sonny and Cher, the Fifth Dimension, all these bands, and I'm like in awe, and we're getting played more and more on the radio, and... I'm loving everything they're doing, and all of a sudden, you know, they're getting into what we're doing with this whole new sound, you know, but it really blew a lot of people's minds in those days, but uh, it actually changed the way the business was, marketing, because you had to have a hit single before your album came out, because it would, uh, you know, be featured on your album, everybody would buy the album because the hit single was on there. But with the fudge, when Keep Me Hanging On, the edited version came out the first time. It, it didn't, they say it was ahead of its time because it went up to about number 80 and it fell off the charts. So we thought we were done, you know. And then uh, I guess about three weeks later, all of a sudden the album, because of all the airplay, started churning up the charts before you knew it. And I forget, we thought it was over. All of a sudden it shot up like, 50 points, it was like 33 with a bullet in Billboard. And we were on the West Coast playing at the Whiskey. Uh, I don't know, just playing all these uh, water parks up and down, like in Portland and Seattle, with Sunny and Chair in the Fifth Dimension, and a band called Moby Grape from San Francisco. Moby Grape. Moby Grape. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, all of a sudden, we were like, wow, man, we were really happening. Let's take in a look England. at that album cover. So the, here's the cover yeah. for for the first album. Any story about the artwork or how that all came together? Well, I, my recollection is we 
it was, there was about three or four different approaches and somehow that, that was just the one that stuck actually i liked another one better <laughs> i remember that was the uh consensus of opinion but actually in retrospect that's a pretty cool album cover the image yeah yep and, and how long did it take to record uh well i guess so uh, because you mentioned we started recording in the in the late fall in the winter of 66 and by uh by the spring of 67 it was done yeah and then it was released uh the next in august yeah and so then how many when did the band i don't want to I still want to talk about some stuff before this happened, but when did the band uh, break up? 1970. 1970. First time. So, first time, yeah. It, right, in terms of uh, that. But between when that album came out in 67 and 70, well, you guys must have done, I, I can't even, do you have any idea how many shows you you guys played? I really don't know. But <clears throat> I know we were like the second hardest working band in America. James Brown was number one. We were constantly on the road. And that's probably why we broke up. Because we just spent way too much time together. And then when we became famous, you know, you change. First fame. First fame is very difficult to handle when you're that young. You know, you're 20, 21 years old, and all of a sudden you leave. You know, rock gods, as they said, whatever. It's the way it was, everybody it was in the pop universe. And it's hard to handle it. The ego, it's like an explosion of egos. You know, everybody changes. We started getting to areas of disrespecting each other, I'm sorry to say, at different points. Some thought that they were better than others in the band. All of a sudden, it started, you know, going to hell. You know? If we were just together too long, like being married to three women instead of one <laughs> at the same time. So that's uh that's the history of most bands. Yeah, who's ready for any of that? You know, when you get right down to it. It's, yeah. it's not everybody has the aspiration. We you want that because it looks so cool, it's so glamorous, music. Yeah, but like be careful what you wish for, it just might happen. And it did happen. <laughs> we did wish for it and it did happen. And uh Fame brings incredible elation, but it brings pain too, man, you know? Because you, sometimes you just want to be yourself and away from the maddening crowd and the lights that you're not allowed to be when you have that level of uh, popularity, you know? So I really enjoyed it years later, the second time around. We reformed a couple of times, and since 2005, we've been playing pretty much, and it's been much more fun for me than I think everybody. In the band, you know, it, it, it's been uh, really cool. And so the other day, uh, we, we've been doing this process with a number of folks and gone really in depth. We're still working with doing this with David Givens, who, of course, was the uh, founder, founding member of Zephyr and the husband of Candy right. Givens. And so he talked about how in 69, uh, Barry Face sent him down to Phoenix for three weeks to do a number of shows. And he said one of them was with the Vanilla Fudge. And so that leads me to that question. Do you remember that night? Do you I remember? Don't. Zephyr? No, I really don't remember. And so that then leads to the follow-up. How did you become aware of Tommy Bolin? Well, I, when I... Uh... When I, I moved out to California with my, with my family, <coughs> excuse me, in the early 70s, and uh, I wanted to be Elton John. I loved Elton John's early songs and style of you know, piano and all of that. And I know I was known as a piano player, but I started getting into you know, rhythm piano and trying to write songs. So I went out there and got to get a solo deal. I could fast forward this probably after a year and a half. I didn't become Elton John. Okay. So I, wanted, <laughs> I thought of putting the band together. And I recruited a couple of really good guys. Reggie McBride was the bass player, playing with Stevie Wonder. And he was, God, he's just a kid. Must have been, what, 20, maybe 22, 23 years old. 
we got together, we started talking, we started jamming together, and it got so great. What a feel, and a great personality. And uh, I think Bobby Cochran was the guitar player that uh, was playing with us. And uh, he was in Steppenwolf at the time. Uh, he had a very famous uncle, Eddie Cochran, you know, summertime blues, so that was his uncle. Yeah. He was a really yeah. good player and a great guy. We started rehearsing together, and all of a sudden, Reggie said, you know, I, I got a call from, to go down and play with this guy, Tommy Bowman, which I was hearing about from the teaser album. <clears throat> and of course, you know, it's become a very popular replacement. Richie Blackmore and Led Zeppelin. So then he left, left, left uh, I'm sorry, Deep Purple, of course. He left Deep Purple and started a solo career. So that's Reggie ironic. called me up and said, Let me, let me you know, just say, that's ironic that you said that because. When Led Zeppelin did in, I mean, when Deep Purple did in rock, my theory is that they were kind of looking at what was going on with Led Zeppelin and yeah. said, we need to change our format to get heavier. And so it's kind of a, so, a Freudian slip for you to say Richie Blackman yeah, and Led Zeppelin. Right, right. <laughs> so anyway, Reggie so. said, uh, you know, I'm going to be auditioning for this Tommy Bowen's new band. and. I said, all right, well, cool. And then he called me up and he said, look, I got the gig. So I'm not going to, not going to be able to, you know, try and get this deal with you. Cause I'm going to be busy. It looks like it's going to be a lot of cool shows. And I said, dude, you know what? He'll tell me I want to come down and meet him. I want to come down and play too. And that's how that happened. He called me back. He said, yeah, Tommy, the big fan of yours wanted you to come down to SIR in LA. And so I did. You know, we started jamming together, and that's how that happened. You know, a couple of days later, he invited me to, yeah, to, you know, to be in the band. And next thing, Narda Michael Walden was fresh out of Mahavishnu Orchestra, and he came to rehearsal, and Norma Jean Bell, uh, you know, great tech player and singer from Frank Zappa's band, joined. And that's how that whole, uh, you know, that, uh, that band started. So, cool. so let's talk a little bit about those early rehearsals. And just, I mean, we're talking a bunch of professional musicians here who got to that point because people were talented. And so you get together and you're just able to just talk a language musically with each other. What what do you remember about those early moments with uh, playing with Tommy and with Reggie? Ah, it was uh, very pleasant. It was like very pleasant, I remember. I remember listening to Tommy play and I, you know, like some Hammond behind his licks and a little piano. And that was my first introduction, introduction to a Moog, mini Moog. I went and got my first mini Moog synthesizer. That's when I started using that and string machines. And that was uh, the beginning of that for me, multi keyboards. So I started integrating my style with his. And Michael Walden, uh, you know, I mean, I played with some great drummers in my career. He's was, you know, right up there, one of the best. And, uh, I just remember it was a cool trip, and uh, I was excited, and everybody loved this band. It was a, a blend of lots of different styles, and uh, it worked. It worked. And what was cool about Tommy was he wanted to feature everybody in the band, you know, because Michael Walden was a really cool songwriter, and uh, he had a song called Delightful, and Tommy said, well, let's do your song, and, and it was really cool. Challenging for me, that, but I, I got it together. And I, I thought I played it pretty well with him. And then I had written a song called I Fell in Love, which was like a Ray Charles blues oriented kind of song, and uh, Tommy loved it. And what was cool about it is it was Reggie and Norma Jean and Tommy were singing the background. They were, I could do it like Ray Charles kind of thing, you know, and they called themselves the Sniffettes instead of the Ray Lefts. <laughs> so it was, it was a great moment for me. and for the band and it, the song always went over really well live that i do remember so 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 let's go ahead and take a listen to it from uh the my father's place show which of course was near your hood <laughs> All right, Pat. That I can't huh? explain. Yeah. 
Something I from above me. Something come over me. Tell him to cut it. Cut it. Oh. But it isn't pain. Cut it. After this, a long time. I fell I fell in love with you. I'm not the same man. That song could have been a hit. I'm not going to do that now. That I was before. You knocked on my heart's door And I fell in love Fell in love I fell in love I fell in love With you Wow. Wow. <laughs> you hear me? 
Yeah, I, I, I muted yeah, you. I know. Like, during... Wow, I was still in it. Huh? That was pretty cool. I, everybody thought that was going to be a big hit, man. Back then, you I mean, we're, we're going back what over forty years, way over forty years. Everybody said, "Man, you're going to get a, you know, that's going to be a big song." You know, it was crazy. Well, that was the era when well, payola became a thing, obviously, back in the mid seventies, and and somebody had to be writing a check. <laughs> but it, obviously, yeah. that song, your performance, that band, just pretty cool, incredible, incredible. It was real, man. It really was. Wow, I haven't listened to it in so long. Listening to that, what a what a night that was. Yeah, man. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because that was the first you were... time we did it at the Roxy. Yep. In the L.A., that was like the first big show, and uh, I remember I was my foot was shaking. I was so so nervous, man. My first time back in front of a huge crowd after been all fudge, you know, after a couple of years. And, but uh, yeah, once we started going, you know, it all became natural again. <laughs> and that night there, you were in Roslyn, which of course was basically like homecoming for both you and Narada. As oh yeah, we yeah. Both lived in the area. And there, you must have had some, I would assume some Mark Stein fans perhaps were there that night. Fans, but yeah, sure. A, My old manager came out and, uh, yeah. It's kind of like I remember I came up with this crazy intro on the keyboard for a wild dog, I think it was. A big, yep. Long intro thing. Everybody was like, didn't know what was happening. And it morphed into wild dog. That was, that was really cool. When I listened to that in retrospect, you know, I was like, man. You know, it was a pretty happening deal going on there. Nice stuff. Not a lot of nice music. Yeah. And it just shows that fame is fleeting. Talent, you know, is like important. But boy, how do you grab the brass ring? How do you get things to happen? And it's so many people don't ever get that shot. And with this band, which was only together for a little over three and a half weeks. Yeah. It was a super group. I mean, you look back at this and who all was in it, who all they became or what they were able to contribute. Just literally a super group, which never got acknowledged really as such. So, well, I mean, it probably would have if Tommy could have uh, controlled his demons. You know, I don't know if you want to get into that. You know, his untimely passing, like 25 years well, old, led right up to that, hmm. but. Well, I'm wondering, do you need to go? I, I'm, I'm thinking you might. I, I do. Know. Can we do this so, in another, like part two? Part two. Let's let's do part two. That would be great. And, and uh, I'm going to promise my wife that I'm taking it somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, I just want to thank you for taking the time to do this, and uh, I'm going to stop the recording. and We'll be back for part two. I'm gonna. I've got something else I want to say once we stop the recording. So, Mark Stein will be back for part two. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.